Hello, and welcome to A Reader's Paradise. I'm your host, Earl Sewell. This is a great place to hang out if you love hearing literature performed for you, as well as hearing author interviews. Hello, and welcome to episode number seven of A Reader's Paradise. In this episode, I'm going to be reading uh, something very special. I'm going to be reading from uh, a slave narrative. Uh, And when I talk about slavery, I'm talking about uh, chattel slavery in the United States. Uh, The stories are coming from the federal government back in the early 20th century, between about 1935 and 1938. The federal government in the United States commissioned writers to travel throughout the South to collect uh, recollections of slavery from former slaves. And they put this in the public domain so that anybody could go out there and read what it was like uh, for slaves during that time. And so for this episode, I'm going to read uh, a narrative uh, from one of those interviews. There are several reasons that I'm choosing to read writing from uh, former slaves. Uh, One is the world should never forget what took place during that time in human history. Um, It is something that that should constantly remind us of what humanity should not do. It reminds us of the worst in humanity, but somehow highlights the enduring human spirit. Another reason is because this takes place, these interviews were taking place in the 1930s, it also ties into my work of historical fiction called Lenny Gray, which takes place between 1918 and 1951. So my protagonists in uh, Lenny Gray would have had access to this information from former slaves and also information about what life was like would have been passed down through the oral tradition in storytelling. And also this would have uh, served as a way for those who came through slavery to teach the new generation how to deal with Jim Crow, which as we, as we know now, or as I will say in history, was the second round of slavery here in the United States, which lasted from about 1875 into the 1960s. So with that being said, let me tell you a little bit more about it. This is from, this narrative is from a former slave named Leah Garrett. Um, She was a slave in Richmond County, Virginia. And so uh, by the time this particular interview of her was taken, um, she had a hair, uh, she had hair as white as snow and she was rather old. However, she recalls the trauma that she experienced very vividly. And that's one of the interesting things about emotional trauma. It leaves a neurological imprint on the brain that you never forget. Also, what I would like to add to this is that for African Americans who saw violence committed against their fellow citizens or family members or other, you know, slaves on the plantation, this left them feel this left them with a feeling of worthlessness and it also aids into this commonality of experience. In other words, this commonality of misery and suffering. Um, And so this sort of thing has been um, plaguing the United States history for a long time. For example, in today's term, it's 2018, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, in my mind, you know, relates back to the idea that goes back to slavery, where your life meant nothing um, to those who were in power. And so when we read Leah Garrett's story, you'll begin to understand why this is. You'll begin to understand 
how one can get a sense of worthlessness, uh, not only within them, not only within themselves, but how others may perceive them as worthless. And this has carried on for generations. And um, this is why one of the reasons why we should never forget what took place during the antebellum slave period, because there's an old African proverb that I would like to say before I before I stop and continue. There's an old African proverb that says, until the lion is able to tell his side of the story, we will only hear the hunter's version. So for me, this is a way of telling the lion's side of the story so that we don't only hear the hunter's version of the story. With that, let's get into our story. Okay, before we begin, let's take a deep breath. Mm. Here we go. Leah Gatt, an old negress with snow white hair, leaned back in her rocker and recalled the customs and manners of slavery days. Mistreatment at the hands of her master is outstanding in her memory. I know so many things about slavery time till I never will be able to tell them all, she declared. In them days, preachers was just as bad and mean as everybody else. There was a man who folks called a good preacher. He was one of the meanest men I ever seed. When I was in slavery under him, he done so many bad things till God killed him. His wife or children could get mad with you, and if they told him anything, he always beat you. Most times, he beat his slaves when they hadn't done nothing at all. Ooh, one Sunday morning, his wife told him that the cook would never fix nothing that she told her to fix. The time she said it, he jumped up from the table and went to the kitchen and made her go under the porch where he always whipped his slaves. She begged and prayed, but he didn't pay no attention to that. He put her in what us all called a swing. And he beat her until she couldn't holler. Poor thing, already had heart trouble. That's why he put her in the kitchen. But he left her swinging there and went to church, preached, and called himself Southern God. When he got back home, she was dead. Whenever your master had you swinging up, nobody wouldn't take you down. Sometimes a man would help his wife, but most times he was beat afterwards. Another master I had kept a hog shed to whip your own. This hog shed had two or three hoops around it. He buckled you face down in the hog shed and whipped you until you bled. Everybody always stripped you in them days to whip you because they didn't care who sees you naked. Some folks, children, took sticks and jabbed you all the while you was being beat. Sometimes these children would beat you across the head and they, they just didn't know what the word stop was. Another way Mazza had to whip us was in in a stock that he had in the stables. This was where he whipped you when he was real mad. He had logs fixed together with holes for your feet, 
hands and head. He had a way to open these logs and fasten you in. Then he had his coachman give you so many lashes, and he would let you stay in the stock for so many days and nights. That's why he had it in the stable, so it wouldn't rain on you. Every day, you got the same number of lashes. You never come out of you never come out of there able to sit down. I had a cousin with two children. The oldest one had to nurse one of Maz's grandchildren. The front steps was real high. One day, this poor child fell down these steps with the baby. His wife and daughter hollered and went on terrible. And when Mazza come home, they were still hollering, just like the baby was dead or dying. When they told him about it, he picked up a board and hit this poor little child across her head and killed her right there. Then he told his slaves to take her and throw her in the river. Oh, her mom begged and prayed. But he paid her no attention. He made him go to child in. One of the slaves married a young gal, and they put her in the big house to work. One day, mistress jumped on her about something, and the girl hit her back. Mistress said she was going to have master put her in the stock and beat her when he come home. When that girl went to the field and told her husband about it, he told her where to go and stay there until he got there. That night, he took his supper to her. He carried her to a cave and hauled pine straw and put it there on the floor for her to sleep on. He fixed that cave up just like a house for her. Put a stove in there and run the pipe through the ground and into a swamp. Everybody always wondered how he fixed that pipe. Of course, they didn't cook until night when nobody could see the smoke. He sealed the house with pine logs, made beds and tables out of pine poles, and they lived in this cave for seven years. During this time, they had three children. Nobody was with her when these children was born but her husband. He waited on her with each child. The children didn't wear no clothes except for a piece of cloth tied around their waist. They was just as hairy and wild, and they looked like wild people. They was running wild. They would come out of that cave, and they would run every time they'd see the person. Uh, the seven years she lived in the cave, different folks helped her keep them in food. Her husband would take it to a certain place, and she would go and get it. People had passed over this cave so many times, but nobody knew these folks was living there. Our master didn't know where she was, and it was freedom before she came out of that cave for good. Us lived in a long house that had a flat top and a little rooms made like mule stalls, just big enough for you to get in and sleep. There were no floors in these rooms and neither no beds. Us made beds out of dry grass. But us had cover, cause the real old people who couldn't do nothing else made plenty of it. Nobody weren't allowed to have fires. If they was caught with any, that meant a beating. So some would burn charcoal and take the coals to their rooms to help keep warm. Every person had a tin pan, tin cup, and a spoon. 
Everybody couldn't eat at the same time. Us had about four different sets. Nobody had a stove to cook on. Everybody cooked on five places and used skillets and pots. To boil, us hung pots on racks over the fire and baked the bread and the meats in the skillets. Mazza had a big room right side of his house where his vittles was cooked. Then the cook had to carry him upstairs and on a tray to be saved. When there was something to eat, it was carried to the dining room where it was set on the table and served from this table. There wasn't no food put on the dining room table for eating. The slaves went to church with their masters. The preachers always preached to the white folks first. Then they preached to the slaves. They never said nothing but you must be good. Don't steal. Don't talk back to your masters. Don't run away. Don't do this and don't do that. They let colored preachers preach, but they gave them almanacs to preach out of. They didn't allow us to sing songs as we shall be free and oh for a thousand tongues to sing. They always had somebody to follow the slaves in the church when the colored preacher was preaching to hear what was said and done. They was afraid of us. They was afraid we would say something against them. That concludes the narrative that Leah Garrett gave. (sighs) What can I say about this particular narrative? There are so many things in it that strike me. Um, One of the first things I will say is the level of brutality and the absence of humanity that was... um, that was, you know, perpetrated against uh, against slaves. One of the other interesting things that strikes me with this narrative is that the slave owner was a man of the cloth or a preacher or a man of God who was, you know, probably came from the, from the Christian tradition. I guess the thing that that stands out in my mind is that Christians at one point were persecuted um, for their beliefs back during when there was a battle for the belief in Christ and God and uh, paganism. And it, it seems strange to me that the very thing that Christians were fighting against because they were being brutalized is the very society that they became. In other words, they ended up brutalizing those who were who were like them who were being persecuted yet they turned it around and made it okay religiously for them to do this to make it okay for them psychologically and so not only did african americans suffer psychologically from slavery but um white christians also suffered psychologically from it. They suffered because they lost their sense of humanity. Um, and, you know, I, you know, one could argue that that sense of superiority and entitlement and all of those other things that came along out of slavery are still in existence today and causes psychological pain when they run across people or situations or circumstances or stories in our society about those who are descendants from slaves, um, when they run across stories that don't match what they've been taught or what they've been led to believe. And that causes a bit of pain. One of the things that we know from psychology now is that there is something in the brain called the amygdala. It's your fight, flight, or freeze mechanism. It's the thing that tells you to step out of the way real quickly if you see a car coming down the street and you're about to step off of a curve. 
However, this particular area of the brain floods the body with a stress hormone called cortisol. And it, it and the cortisol allows you to react and to, you know, get to safety. However, what we know is that if you are in a constant situation where you're constantly looking for threats, the amygdala never learns how to turn itself off. And when the body is flooded with, you know, this sort of stress hormone, there are biological outcomes to this. Uh, one of the biological outcomes can be something like hypertension. Um, you know, there's a, a that heightened sense of awareness that anything can happen to you at any time. And so to have a group of people who live under this constant heightened awareness and the constant threat of something happening to them had to really, really leave a psychological scar. And even if it wasn't happening to them personally, the fact that they saw crimes committed against people that they knew or loved ones, as as Leah talks about her cousin who had two children and how the young girl was hit over the head with a board and killed. And then how they were forced to throw the girl in the river as if she was nothing, as if even in death, she couldn't even be buried in a humane way. The other thing that struck me about this was the lengths that the one husband went through to protect his wife. In one, from one perspective, it is a great and wonderful and noble thing where, you know, this man obviously loved this woman deeply to put himself in harm's way for seven years. Um, and also to have three children with them while they lived in a cave. And so, Again, in, in from one perspective, I say, you know, wow, you know that that's that's such a heroic thing. But uh, from another perspective, it was like, was the cost too great? Because they had to live like cavemen, as Leah says that they were hairy children and they only had a cloth around them, and whenever they saw people coming, they ran. And they didn't come out of the cave until uh, the end of slavery. Um, And one has to wonder what happened, or at least I wonder, what happened to those children? How how did they integrate into society? Were Were they able to? Were they able to function? And what happened to their children and so on and so forth? Because what I know for sure is that stories, morals values, belief systems, and all of those things are passed down generationally from one generation to the next. And if nobody ever looks to make a correction or an update to values, to family values and belief systems, well, these things can go on for one generation after the next to the point where nobody even knows why they behave this way or have these beliefs to begin with well anyway i hope you have enjoyed the slave narrative by leah garrett until next time happy reading